Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School, and I just want a quilt. So thanks to our Quilting Army member, Judy Walker, who went to Missouri Star Quilt Company in Hamilton, Missouri, and connected to some important people there, we have as our guest today, Jenny Doan. Yes, I know, hard to believe, hard to believe. It's really just hard to believe. For those that don't know Jenny, she... People say she's like the Oprah of the quilting world, and man, it was exciting to chat with her. So um, the interview is about a half hour, 40 minutes long, and um, I asked Judy, um, Judy Walker, who was our connection, to join us. She's a professional journalist, um, and she's my neighbor and friend. My name is Jenny Doan, and I'm calling from Hamilton, Missouri. So very cool. And we are so, so thrilled to have you here. It's so beyond exciting. We always start with the first question, which is, what's your first memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life? Uh, My first memory of sewing is actually, um, it wasn't actual sewing. It was kind of stapling things together and taping things together. And and I can remember that when I discovered scissors, the only fabric I had was in my mother's closet. Uh Uh-oh. And so I cut a little piece, just a small piece, um, and I, I, I to make a, an outfit for uh, my Barbie or my doll, one of the things, and uh, I can still see my mother standing at the end of the hallway with that um, clothing piece with a hole in it, hollering, Jenny! <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then they, they enrolled me in 4-H after that, but uh, I was just determined to, to make things. I was a maker. Well, your story is amazing, and I've been watching all these. I had a great week being able to just um, immerse myself in um, all things you. Um, And so (laughs) what I want to try to do with the the bit of time we have with you, and we'll try to go like maybe half hour, 45 minutes, if that works for you, um, is to talk about sort of like, so I have a bunch of links to sort of the story of your family and the business and all of that. So what I thought we might do is sort of, I wanted to get your perspective on sort of what is this quilting world at this point. So it seems like, uh, it seems like you, um, you were really, things all really changed, right? So 2008 is when you guys begin, and now to, 10 years later, the whole world looks really different. And you were so part of that, you are so part of that. I'm curious sort of what you think is, what is this world? What is, is this the new phase of quilt? Like, is this a new chapter in the history of quilting, I guess? Oh, I absolutely think it's a new chapter. Now, did I intend to do that? No, that was never my plan. You know, uh, my, we're, we're much better problem solvers than we are planners. And so for us, it was a mode of survival. But in doing what we did, um, nobody had done it before. So it started with us going online and doing tutorials online. People people weren't doing that yet. Uh, and so all of a sudden, people, quilters were learning in a different way. And they had always just gone to a quilt shop or to their local guild or brought somebody in to take a class. And all of a sudden, they have um, they have the opportunity to do that in the privacy of their own home. They can replay it as much as they want. If they forget what the teacher said, they can rewind it. You know, it's a whole new way of learning. And that wasn't actually something that um, we set out to do. It was just the most convenient thing for us because we, you know, we were in a small town and Alan, Alan went online to see what was happening with quilting and quilting just hadn't made the jump yet. So all of a sudden people can learn uh, at their own convenience. So it was a completely different way of, of doing things. It's, it, it, it's remarkable. How much of sort of, it, you kind of get this dual thing with your development. You get the the online presence and then sort of your rebuilding of the town. And I think about like today, like this this debate of like the shop versus online and you haven't chosen. So I'm curious what your thoughts are about that space as well of, you know, how we should think about our, um, our, uh, our shop came first, you know, uh, for us, we wanted 
we needed a place to work and do our tutorials out of and that sort of thing. So we, we, we got this little building and had a little business here. And as we started getting uh, more fabric and stuff and, and more people, we outgrew this space. So then we went to Main Street. Well, in the same same uh, time, we have it, – it's, um, it's us who are uh, – we're, we're – Selling, we're putting these tutorials on and people start asking for fabric. Well, we weren't really carrying fabric. You know, we were just teaching people how to sew and, you know, we didn't really have any fabric. And so we decided we better start carrying some fabric and getting some fabric. And then we used those in the tutorials. And of course, that's what sold. And uh, so then um, we knew that having a store in Hamilton was never going to... Um, well, there, we just didn't feel like the local community is what was going to keep us going, but we were building an online presence. And so the online community was going to, is going to be what keeps us going and what keeps our, our business afloat. But we also love the idea of still having the brick and mortar. I'm, I'm the brick and mortar. You know, I don't, I think my kids might've just, if it wasn't for me, they probably would have just, uh, you know, done uh, online and, and, and to be honest, it would be a lot less headache to just do online, a lot less expense to do online. Mm. Um, but I love the idea of the brick and mortar and having a quilt shop and that sort of thing. It's really interesting. Now, what about quilt tourism? So you are like, what about- you are like one of the main destinations for quilt tourism and quilt tourism is like a thing, right? Like I have to go to Paducah, I have to go to, to Missouri Star. Was that the case in 2008? Like how has quilt tourism developed no. over no, time? No, no. So, you know? so that, um, that was really interesting because we were in this one building, our, our first building, and everything happened in this building and it just got – you know, as we grew, the building got smaller and smaller, and we bought a, a Main Street shop and figured everything would run out of there, and then we'd have um, we'd have our, our little building over here to ship things and, and keep our inventory and that sort of thing. And uh, it wasn't too long before we got uh, too much fabric to put out in our main shop. And then Sarah asked me one day, she asked me what kind of fabric we had the most of, and I said I thought it was probably Civil War. And so... Um, she said, well, I'm going to buy one of these buildings, these abandoned buildings, and we'll fix it up and put Civil War fabric in it. And I think when we bought the third building, we were like, this is a really cool thing. You know, what was interesting to me is that here I am in my little tiny building, and, um, and one day a lady showed up from New York, and she said, I watched you online, and I came to meet you. And I was just like, wait, what? You know? <laughs> I mean, I was just so stunned by that. Because in my mind, you know, it, I, I've never been able, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm too old, I'm the wrong generation to grasp that if you talk into a little wire, it can go all over the world, you know? I mean, it's just so bizarre to me. I mean, you don't even need the wire. And so, uh, so the fact that people were watching and listening all over the world was, uh, it was just amazing to me. Do you have any figures or idea, Jenny, on how many people come from how many states or how many countries or how many tourists you do get in that little tiny town of Hamilton? You know, I, I don't have the figures, um, they, but we might have them. So you might just be able to drop a line to, you'll want to talk to Caleb, mm-hmm. C-A-L-E-B, at MissouriQuiltCo.com. Mm-hmm. Cool. Because there were just he buses have a, arriving have some, one after another. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he may have some numbers. I, 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 uh, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if they do or not. That's, you know, I don't have to. Mm-hmm. That's not mine. I can't mm-hmm. do that. Okay. Part. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing that occurred to me to ask you about was how many. Um, so you must be designing quilts constantly to make all these new tutorials and have a new one every week. I do make a lot of quilts. That's for sure. We make at least one. <laughs> at least, at least. Uh, well, when you make one quilt, you make one completed quilt, and you make two partial quilts, right. and uh, and then you have to make a mock quilt to make sure that the design's actually going to work. So that one quilt actually almost gets made four times, wow. and then they're made again in, in uh, six weeks for block. They come out in block magazine in all different fabrics. Right. I mean, in another another set of fabrics, and so and our fabric is current when we release them. So one of the things that um, that my brain does is uh, is is it sees about 20 different things that you could do with a block. And I think for most quilters' lives, what they do is they, 
they see a quilt, they buy the kit because they want their quilt to look just like that, that, uh, that kit, that quilt. And for me, uh, I was always, what happens if I add a corner on here or I cut this in half? And I don't know why, I don't know why I had no fear. Maybe I, ha- maybe I didn't know the rules of quilting well enough to know that it could be done this way. But I was just constantly, well, what happens if I do this? Well, what happens if I, you know, I mean, and it was just so stunning to me. One of my favorite things that happens is when I make a quilt and the secondary block, you know, I'm not prepared for the secondary block and the secondary block will be something that I'm just stunned. I'm just like, what? There's a star over there? You know? I, just, I just love that part of it. Really but I do a lot with old blocks. You yeah. know, I, um, I, uh, the things that have uh, public domain things, you know, yeah. I can take a pinwheel and, and cut it. I cut it and in, into make a nine patch out of a pinwheel and, you know, make a million different things. And so I do a lot of things with uh, existing blocks and, uh, <clears throat> you know, and so just like, try to keep, try to bring up something new every week. That's amazing. And then what kind of staff do you have to help you do this? Cause this is, seems overwhelming on my, that seems like a lot. So we have, um, I have actually three, uh, so, four sewers. Um, in here and um, and they've just been here um, I think Carol's been here the longest well I know Carol's been here the longest but um, and she has she has sewn with us for quite a few years but m- most of the rest of them are here less than two years wow so you know I, I really did sew the lion's share of things up until the last couple of years and now wow. I have some really good helpers it's kind of like Rumpelstiltskin you know you come in from a traveling engagement and you're like what my quilt is made <laughs> that's so, great so that makes it that makes i it love really that fun. that's really interesting um so i did one of your quilts um in preparation for this and um so yeah. part of the experience so i'm a law professor as you know and, or maybe you don't know i'm a law professor and i quilting every night um and i'm trying different people's experiences and i have to say it was so joyful it was like I felt like I was confident and I did it and there wasn't mistakes. And um, I can see why people cry when they meet you because you make them feel like they can do it and things turn out right. Um, and so I just, that was my, that's just my little like, this is my experiential moment. But um, but it was really great and um, I loved it. It was just really great. And I'm sure you get that all the time. Are you always pitching, like who are you pitching the, do you have, like, so, so you know I think saying? the two groups of people, yeah. the two groups of people that are drawn to what I do, um, first they're beginners, and the and the cool thing about beginners, you know, um, I was sitting in a Tula Pink. Uh, she gave a lecture, and in her lecture, she said that this next generation of children will be the most broadly educated of any because of YouTube. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I thought about that, and I thought, you know, a parent won't pay for a kid to have a take a class at a quilt shop, but he'll let him sit in front of the computer. And, uh, and so I have a large children's following. I have a large beginner following. I have, I have a following of, of um, and, the, and the, the, well, the cool thing to me about the beginners is that they can learn and fail in the privacy of their own home. Yeah. They never have to feel bad about what they're doing because if they don't do it right, they just start it over and do it again. And all of a sudden, and, and I think for most of us, um, I'm sorry, I keep starting different sentences, but that's how my brain works. But I think for most of us, we're so visual. And I think if we can just see somebody do something and you're like, all I'm doing is this right here. And they're like, oh, that's it. I can do that, yeah. you know, and uh, they get really excited about it. And I can't tell you how many people have said to me, um, well, I saw I saw you do this, but I didn't think it would be that easy. And look what I did. You know, it really was that easy. They get really excited about that. That's really and so, uh, so the other the other group that's attracted to me are people who have quilted for all their lives, and um, and they're and they know that somebody's getting married, somebody's graduating, somebody's have a baby, and they want to look amazing without working too hard. Yeah. So they're looking at projects that they can finish rather quickly, but it still looks like um, they 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 paid attention to detail and they made something, um, you know, something that that has a little bite to it. So. Yeah. I, totally, I think those are yeah. those are the main two people, and yeah. and I think one of the compliments for me is that is that um, is that people who who will start with me, and they actually will go on and take a class from someone who does a lot more uh, detailed things. You know, to me that would be a big compliment because you know their confidence has grown to a point where they can't. They actually think 
you know, that that's a possibility for them. And so that's kind of a sweet, uh, a sweet take on that. So your videos are available online. And for those listening who have not experienced Missouri Star Quilt, just go to YouTube and put in quilting in Missouri Star or probably just Missouri Star and you'll get there um, fairly easily. Um, what do you think about the sort of movement of people creating subscriptions and Craftsy and paying for courses that are online? Like, is, has this always been the case? Or, like, there's, like, why would you do that? Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and is that something you've ever contemplated in terms of your perspective of sort of the economics of all the things you're doing? Well, when we started, um, uh, nobody else was doing it. And, and I was actually Crafty's first craft teacher. Really? And um, they approached me, and they wanted me to um, to charge for my classes. And I said, no, I didn't want to do that. And they said, well, we have all these expenses. And I said, well, how cheap can we get them? And they said, well, how about, you know, they came down to two, $29 per class. That was two ninety nine for a lesson. So we had 10 lessons in each uh, in each category. And, um, and, and, and I was the, um, uh, I was, I was contracted with them. I was their only quilt teacher. And then once we let go of that contract, you know, they got lots of them. And, uh, and so I think, I think there's a, I think there's a place for everybody, you know, I mean, there might be somebody on Crafty that, uh, that you want to take one of their classes and you know you're never going to get to wherever they live. And so it makes it convenient for you to be able to do that. And I think, you know, they keep the price pretty low. I just felt like for me, um, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to charge. I can't control the price of fabric, but I can control what I do with my, my brain. And I just wanted to share that. And one of the things I was always taught is that, um, the more you give, the more you get. And so, um, for me, I've always lived with a spirit of gratitude and tried to live with a spirit of generosity as well, where, um, you know, it didn't matter what I had. If you need it, you, you're welcome to borrow it. So um, I it. just, yeah, that's, I, that's just, I'm, I'm not, I would never make a good businesswoman. Honestly, if it wasn't for my son, I would still be in that one room doing that one thing because <laughs> I, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm just not, I'm just not great at the business stuff. Yeah. But, you know, he, he's, he knows. Like, you know, I mean, the, the things that we sell, like we do this daily deal, and that's yeah. a loss leader. And people in the business world know a loss leader and what a loss leader is. And your hope is always that you're generous to a fault that they'll come and they'll say, oh, well, we maybe we would like something else besides just this one thing. You right. know? So explain, so, in, case, in case people don't know what that means, what is a loss? Tell, tell, them, tell us what that means. Well, a loss leader is where you're, um, you're either breaking even or barely making money on a project. So, for instance, if we're selling a daily deal for, uh, I mean, if, we, if, if, if it's $10 and we paid $5 for it, you know, for it, and then we sell it at $1.99, we're losing money. But if we're paying, if you're paying $5 in shipping, we're actually making a dollar, you know, something so yeah. that it's just a li- enough to cover our costs. Um, but not really enough. But the hope is that when you do that, that other people will come in and they will buy other things. And I think that that's how, you know, that's how the businesses run sales and things like that. And it's, I mean, a loss leader is a term that's pretty well known in the yeah in the industry. In the industry, right? right. Um, yeah. So interesting. Well, I'd love to chat more, um, maybe with your son about more of the business side of it. It's so you're so amazing. I mean, you are, you are it, right? Like you are all. You're doing what this world is at the moment in the most spectacular way with the online business and the the um, the uh, brick and mortar and then the tourism. I mean, it's just incredible. And the publishing, um, you've made this incredible empire that is, um, it is the 21st century. You are you, you are the 21st century. And, and it's so it's impressive pretty, when it's, you see We feel pretty town. blessed. It's pretty amazing. Yes. And when you see the town of Hamilton, Missouri, and realize this is all originating out of this little tiny town. And it's how big and you have how many employees? I mean, they must we have about from- we have about we have about 450. Uh-huh. And uh, we have uh, we have our warehouse and we have uh, 13 shops that are fabric specific. They run independently. We probably get anywhere between a couple of hundred and a thousand people a day um, who are coming, making this part of their destination. And, you know, they're, uh, 
it's it's almost like it's a little Disneyland for quilters. You know, it's like oh, it where do you get where do you get all that in one shop? And then what was fun was that as we started to redo the buildings, and this is where the problem solving part comes in. As we started to redo the buildings, you know, you have to pay a guy to fix all the cement that's in between all the bricks that were put up in 1800s. You know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it doesn't look so pretty. So then you paint a mural and then you, you know, it's so, it's, you so love the mural, you paint another mural and another mural, you know, and it's, um, and the town gets prettier and then people come and they want to eat. And so, you know, we, you know, you contact people in the town who want a restaurant and, you know, say, you know, we'll, we'll do the building if you guys run it. And, and, um, and, uh, and so they, you know, they get a restaurant and then more restaurants come in. So we, I think we have like five restaurants now. Oh my goodness. And, um, that's great. and, you know, where we used to just say it's Subway in the gas station. That's where we get our food. You know? That's amazing. <laughs> now, yeah. ha has the population of Hamilton increased since all of this activity I, has happened? I would guess a little bit, but I, I still think we have a lot of people who come from, um, you know, so surrounding communities and, um, we're only 45 minutes from Kansas City, so we have people who come from there. So I would guess it has um, it has grown a little, but I I, I don't think uh, it's not grown substantially. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not like new housing developments popping up and things like that, although that's been talked about. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> well, so what is on the agenda next for uh, Hamilton? Any more like restaurants or any other quilting type? We of do have. Well, we do have uh, we have several other things that we're looking at now. Now, understand that we have more ideas than we're ever going to have time for. We're that family where every right. twenty minutes we have a new idea, <laughs> and uh, there, there's just not enough of us to do them. So, uh, one of the things that um, uh, we have we have a couple more stores that are op going to open up this year, and uh, one of those is going to be a store called Let's Make Art. So, it's a watercolor store, uh -huh. and I had. I had read a book um, called uh, Big Magic, uh, who's the same lady who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. I can't think of her name, uh -huh. but Elizabeth uh, Gilbert. It's all, yes, all about creating and creating out of your, the, you know, out of the, the parts where you're comfortable. And so um, Alan, Alan was starting an art company because he wanted to do for the art world what he did for the fabric world. See, nobody online had done fabric where this is my son, Alan. Mm -hmm. And nobody online had done, done fabric where it said, if you're buying this, these are the pieces that go with it. These are the solids that actually match. And other people who bought this bought this. I mean, we do it for clothes all the time, sure. but no one had done that for fabric. So he took the fabric world into that. Well, then um, he starts looking at the art world as an arm of Missouri Star. Uh, and, and that hasn't worked out. But he decided to go ahead and do this art um, piece and do watercolor. And so we have... He brought a girl out who's doing the same thing on Tuesday night, uh, Facebook Live called Let's Make Art for, um, for, for fabric. You know, how he has me doing tutorials. He has her doing these classes on Tuesday night where you paint along with her. Wow. And, it, and it's pretty amazing because I had started painting um, at the same time uh, that he was working on this with her. So she's going to, she'll have a little shop that has all her watercolors in and you can go in and take an hour long class or that sort of thing because when you come to a destination shop you do want experiences that's really so, cool. um, that's amazing so I know that's going to be one I don't know what the other one's going to be I know eventually I'd love to get into apparel oh. uh, but apparel is apparel is huge and if you do apparel you have to do it right yeah. and so this, the building the shop that they're finishing this year that building is not big enough to be an apparel building so I'm not sure what's going to go in there but I know we have lots of ideas that's really cool <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, one more question, and then we're going to go on to just a little bit of intellectual property if, before we end, if that's cool with you. So uh, we get a lot of people saying, why isn't sewing taught at school? Should we, we bring back home ec? And it seems like you're tapping into kids in a way that maybe people should be thinking about it a little bit differently. So I'm curious about what you think about the, the up-and-coming or the young generation. Like, is sewing dying, or sort of how do we – how do we how do we infuse that into the next generation? So um, I have a couple of thoughts on that. Number one, one of the things I always tell the ladies that if you don't share the knowledge you have before you die, it dies with you. And so, you know, I said along your journey, somebody's going to say to you, hey, you're getting really good at this. I want one of those. And you can either 
you can either make them one or you can teach them. And I always say, make sure you teach them. I teach how to teach their grandchildren, you know, how, how to yeah. start their children and their grandchildren sewing. Yeah. I get a huge number of people that come to Missouri Star here and I'll say, oh, are you, are, are you a quilter? And they'll say, no, this, my granddaughter is, and we wanted to bring her here, mm-hmm. you know, because she started watching it online and oh. all of a sudden, you know, she's watching it. I've had, a, I've had some really interesting experiences with that generational sewing because it used to be grandma sews. Mom doesn't want to sew because grandma shoved it down the throat all her life, but the granddaughter really wants to sew. And so she starts sewing in front of the computer and all of a sudden mom goes, well, I could be doing that. And all of a sudden now you have three generations again who are doing it. Wow. So I see a huge resurgence. I see, um, you know, again, I think that that education is available to children uh, free online. And, um, you know, people say to me, well, what kind of sewing machine do I need if I do this? And I'll say one that runs, <laughs> you know, just get one that runs, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so so because you, everybody has to start somewhere and you're, you're not going to spend your high dollars. Um, right. I mean, that, that's what, you know, and you're just not going to spend your high dollars to begin. But um, once you realize you have an affinity for it or you really like it, you know, then uh, I think then it, then it makes a difference. But I just see it as a big resurgence. The other thing I see is that we do a retreat for shop owners and we oh. teach them that the Internet, the Internet's not going away. You know that they need to learn how to how to play in the in that field Mm -hmm. and so um what's fascinating to me about that is we'll get 30 women in and they won't they're competitors so they're kind of porcupine ish when they come in you know they're all bristly and um and we bring in our uh our money people our internet people our merchandising people our marketing people and we teach them how to play with the internet and that the more they share with each other then the more you know the more power they have and so um, and so we teach them how to use what we do. For instance, if we put a tutorial out, we say, use that tutorial, send it out to your people, make the our quilt in your fabric, hit it up in your fabric. They can come to your shop and buy your fabric. And they're like, well, how does that help you? And I said, because there's always enough for everybody. And so, uh, you know, I said, they're going to, they're going to come to me to shop if you don't have it, but if you have it, they always want to touch it and feel it first, you know? So, um, so I just think that for for most people, mm-hmm. um, well, for those for the shop owners, the cool thing is that at the end of the week, uh, not only have they learned a lot and had hopefully had some respite because they've been at a retreat, but all of a sudden they have a support system. They have 30 other women where they can go to and they can say, "Oh my gosh, what do you do with that one customer? You know, how do you help that one person? How do you how do you pay your people for making um, you know quilts or samplers or whatever?" You know, I mean, they all of a sudden they have they can they have people they can ask, which which uh, is just unheard of because there's no manual for a shop owner. There's no way they know uh, how to make it work. Yeah, I was just having a conversation with someone about this that does social media for their their job, and it was sort of amazing to me that all of these shops have to sort of figure it out themselves. I mean, it sounds like you're really yeah. giving them huge service because this is complicated. I mean, they were saying, oh, it's not that complicated. I'm, yeah, it's complicated. You've I mean, done it. Right. Well, it's, so, it's, you know. not, it's not complicated. It's not complicated to do your hobby. It's complicated to have a business, a successful business. Right. And if you go into it as a hobby, it's, you're probably not going to have longevity. But if you actually use it as a business, you know, and you're generous. Now, the one number one reason businesses close is because they're not nice. Yeah. And so, uh, so there was a lady when we first started hiring people, that was one of the hardest things for me because I, um, I wanted, I I wanted people, I I didn't know if there'd be somebody who would treat my customers how I would treat them. And so, um, and so there was a lady who used to visit me from uh, Minnesota and she had Dairy Queens up there. And she said, she said, Jenny, there's a place for everybody in your company. You just have to know where to put them. And so I think we work really hard to find that, you know, what it is they really want to do in their magic and, uh, and try to put them where they're going to be most happy. So the people that really can keep on that happy, smiling face all day long, those are the people who go in my shop. And so if they can't be happy all day long, then, um, then they're poison for you in the front of your shop, you know. And so you only get one chance, to, you know, or two maybe to make a good first impression. That's, it's so, so, we were having that same conversation. We couldn't understand why some quilt shops either are a little bit rude to people when they come in 
or sometimes yeah. are not very nice to people who look not, you know, like you and me and Judy, right? That they're right. either male or they're like my kid who's got like half shaved head, but she buys a ton of fabric that they don't really get that they're there for everyone, you know? That's right. Yeah. And so the problem with that is that um, you just have to be unkind to them once and then they're going to come online. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and if you, you know, if you want to thrive, uh, I mean, there's a reason, you know, I, I mean, I can remember talking to some women and saying, tell me again why you want to be in retail because you love people so much, you know, right. it's like, guys, guys, you know, you got to think about this. Right. So we right. tried really hard to make that um, Disneyland experience. And, and I, I am thrilled to tell you that uh, probably 99.8% of all people have always said to me, your, your people are amazing. You know, they're happy, they're helpful, they're, I hear that over and over, and it just thrills me to no end. That's very cool. Well, Judy just got back from there, so she's shaking her head a lot, yes. saying it was and amazing. It's one of the only shops I've ever been in where I was waited on by a young man under like 30 years old, you know, and they're just as knowledgeable as, you know, ladies that are 60 that have waited on me in other shops. So. You know, we read a, I read an interesting article um, when we very first began, and their, their advice was to hire um, boys in your quilt shop, that if you really needed to get stuff done, to hire boys or men, because the women will think they don't know anything, so they'll leave them alone so they can get their job done. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> that's, really, that's really interesting, you know, but our, we, the people who are in your shop, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl. Uh, you have a list of things that you have to accomplish within a certain date, you know, that includes sewing. And so where they come on, um, maybe not knowing as much as they did, you know, very quickly, they're moved through a, um, you know, through a, a, a routine where they, they have to, they have to learn how to cut. They have to learn, you know, what a yard is. And I mean, we just have a list of things. I mean, this is their job. They're mm -hmm. working in a quilt shop. They have to know how to do that. Mm -hmm. It's really but, interesting. So you have a training program for them. We do. We do have mm -hmm. a training for, for, program for them, and it's, they're, uh, they're, we try to train them real well. It's really interesting. Okay, so we're on to the last bit of the interview, which is intellectual property. How important has your trademark and you as a, as a personality been to develop your company? Um, I'm not sure I understand that well, question. You so mean the branding my, and that sort of thing? Right. So here's my theory is that you at the front of the company is super important. So is your name and your brand and, and like you've really developed sort of what Missouri Star, it's just all the stuff you've been talking about, Disneyland and, and sort of your approach to all of it and that that whole feeling of what you've created is the power that is what, I mean, you have lots of power, but I mean, like your, your family has done a lot, but that, I'm, I'm trying to understand the, the role that you as a personality, like how important has that been to building your company? Sort of having you as the person in front. I actually think it's been very important. I think that, you know, one of the things, comments that I always get is, um, is well, there, there are things that are important to people that I didn't realize at the get-go. For instance, my husband travels with me, and he does the trunk shows with me. And at least every third person will comment to me how awesome it is to see a married couple that still loves each other. You know, and there, I think there are um, things that are happening in our world today, and I think it makes people go, oh, there, are, there is some really good little pockets here and there, you know. Yeah. Uh, they like the idea of, of helping a family, and, um, and I think the fact that, um, that, you know, I'm cheerful, they love that I'm cheerful and I'm happy, and that comes across in my videos. People, I think they enjoy that, you know, that oftentimes so our world can be heavy and sad and um, and the, the other thing that I learned that I didn't realize either is that how healing creating can be when you, when you can create something and it doesn't matter whether it's writing or a piece of furniture or a quilt, but that creating is healing. And so as people start sewing in the privacy of their home, they, all of a sudden they're feeling better. They're getting out more. They're, uh, they're accomplishing things and it heals whatever it was that, um, caused them to like miss their step a little bit. That's very cool. Well, this is just like, this is just so fabulous and amazing. And I so appreciate you taking time to chat with us. Um, this is just great. I mean, this is, this means a lot. And I know you're super busy and um, it's just very cool. I really, really Oh, thank you. 
It's um, been my pleasure. Yeah, I feel like, pretty blessed to be getting to do what I what I, I get to do. I it wasn't something that I expected or planned for, and um, honestly, I'm I'm grateful every day. People are like, "Wait, what? You really take a picture?" I'm like, "Are you kidding me? This is like the best day ever." You know? Yeah. I mean, it's just, so great. I mean, the fact that I get to, the fact that I get to sign an autograph, I'm just like, "Really? <laughs> All right then." <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just. It's well, just delightful. Who who would think they would do that in their lifetime? You know, right. I, that wasn't it wasn't part of what I was going to do, but so sure cool. is awesome. Well, your family seems amazing, and what you have built is spectacular. And um, it's just been a delight to have you on. It's really it's a, it's a big moment in our little podcast to have you here. Now, have you have you guys both been to Hamilton? One of you has. I've been there twice, and I tried to get yeah. Elizabeth to come this summer when we went, but she was unable to make it. So. Oh, you'll have to come. Please, when you come, come and find me so that I can see your faces. Oh, it would be great. Definitely. We would love it. Yeah. Yes. We, we, you are definitely now on the list. We've I got took a picture with you this time. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, I do meet a lot of people, and so sure. I, don't, uh, I don't have a very good memory for that at all. And one of the things that's happening is that because I love to travel, you know, when you have a big family, you don't really get to travel. You just go camping a lot. <laughs> and so we get to travel now. People actually uh-huh. pay me to go to places. It's awesome. And, um, and what's fun about that is that, um, is that, wait, I lost my whole train of thought. I hate it when that happens. But uh, wait, what was I talking about? Traveling. When you get to travel. Oh, so one of the things that's happening is that we're traveling. We're now taking big events to people, mm-hmm. so to areas, rather than me being gone all the time. And so I can be here more and meet people more when they're here. But, um, you know, four or five times a year, we'll take a big event to an area. Like this next weekend, we're going to be in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. That's so and cool. so that's a different, different kind of travel and um, uh, makes it... I think it makes it, it's more accessible for people. You know, they may never get to Hamilton, but we can bring a little of Hamilton to them. You should think about uh, putting New Orleans on your list. We've, yes. <laughs> oh, that'd be good. We have, um, how many shops do we have now? We have five There's or five six. five or six, yeah. Yeah, we're, get, we're getting bigger. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to mention that to uh, Meg. What yes. she does, I think, is as people call in and they say, we want Jenny to come here, we want Jenny to come here, uh-huh. she just keeps lists of places. And um, and so when she gets a whole bunch of requests, then we take an event to them. Awesome. We'll have to start calling in. Right to know. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. To get our there quilting you go. army. They call in yes. every day. Yes. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> well, She's you... like, are you that same woman? <laughs> yeah, we'll be like, oh, it's, no, it's somebody else today. <laughs> <laughs> trying to disguise our voices. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Well, you are just amazing. And I thank you again for all your time today. And um, it's just awesome. Do you need to review this before we post it? Or are you okay with us posting it directly? Uh, I think I'm okay. Okay. I think awesome. It, I think it's not the way. I don't, I, I don't think you didn't ask me anything scary. I did not. <laughs> it's not hard-hitting journalism. It really isn't. I mean, I think the most interesting thing is for me, is really that story. How are we going to write the story of what's happening to the quilting industry right now? Because yeah. it is the new chapter. I actually, yeah. You know? And well, so, and also, one of the things I see is that people who are availing of what's available online and becoming a part of that, um, they, they, they're, they're more successful. So they use the tutorials. They'll have people come into uh, their shops and they'll use Block Magazine, and they'll say, buy, buy this one block a year. Every month, we're going to make another block out of it. Now, what's interesting about that is that they can get it free online. They can mm-hmm. see the whole tutorial for free, mm-hmm. but they want to come and make it with somebody first. So they'll come into your shop every month and make that. And when they're in your shop, again, it's that, it's that loss of your thing. You've given them the opportunity to come in the shop, but the chances of them leaving without buying anything is, is pretty slim. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so it's that. It's that whole thing. It just it helps shops, and I've had several shops say to me, "You guys saved us," and I was oh, like, "Oh wow, oh, that's really interesting. How did that happen?" You know. Right. So it's it's just that whole. Um, I think it's the, I don't know. I think it's the generous spirit. I think it's the giving. You know. Uh, mm-hmm. I, think I think it's being willing to help people. Um, pe- all people. Totally. You know, when I went to yeah. when I went to um, QuiltCon. I was really surprised because I thought to myself, I'm, I'm not really a modern quilter, but those were all the quilters who learned to quilt on YouTube. 
Mm. And so they, so they, like they all knew me. <laughs> and, and that was, it was, I, I, I told my husband, I said, I'm just like Michael Jackson. You should put a glove on this hand. <laughs> <You know>? oh, totally. <laughs> but, the, but it was fascinating to me because here are all these people from all walks of life, you know, and I would say some of them aren't, wouldn't be comfortable going in your normal grandma's quilt shop. And yet Mm -hmm. they were quilting and making amazing, interesting, beautiful things. And I don't take all the credit for that, but it is interesting to me that they're learning on YouTube. It's fantastic. I think that's fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much. Um, And New Orleans, we're going to say it one more time, New Orleans, New Orleans, no, just kidding. (laughs) Uh, Come visit us. Uh, We'll try to come visit you again. So it would be great. So thank Thank you you again. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right, take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So this is Elizabeth Townsend Guard. You've been listening to Just Want to Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. We want to hear from you. Join our army, our quilting army. Go to our Facebook page. Suggest people.